We are live, and uh, thank you for tuning back in with us for our conversation, part two, Great Prophetic Reformation. Reformation is the topic, and we're dealing with the prophetic uh, with Ken Fish, who is a native of Los Angeles. Some of you may have seen him last week here on the podcast. He has a, a degree from Princeton University in History and Philosophy of Religion. He also earned a Master's of Divinity degree from Fuller Theological Seminary and holds an MBA at UCLA. He's currently working on his doctoral studies at United Seminary. Uh, Ken has been working in different uh, circles in the in the Christian uh, movement here in America it, with people such as John Wimber with the Vineyard Movement, uh, Rick Joyner. Uh, he's been on different podcasts. You've probably seen him on YouTube if you've followed anything uh, with the Remnant Radio and things of that na- uh, that nature. Ken is the founder of Orbis Ministries, which uh, uh, works within the same uh, area of equipping the body of Christ, keeping in mind the principle of reformation, which is all about getting people to a biblical framework for uh, glorifying Jesus. So Ken, thank you again for joining me. I know we did a little bit of a a pre-launch a minute ago, and we had some audio issues. So now we we're we're back <laughs> at it, and so we're gonna dive right back in. So thanks again for joining us. You're doing good today. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So um, cessationist. Uh, let's 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 tackle cessationist uh, uh, quickly. Not in a uh, not in a negative way, but let's tackle their arguments. Uh, they. Uh, many of them who, you know, you, you always have the, the bad apples in each bunch, uh, but I've met a lot who are just concerned that the canon of Scripture is at risk by having a modern gift of prophecy. Uh, but they're also saying, hey, yes, there is a need for a prophetic reformation, but here's what it should be. Let's just listen to the prophecies that are in the Bible and nothing more. And so I wanted to get your feedback on that and uh, and see how you w- might respond to those arguments. Well, it's an important question um, because, as you point out, uh, a lot of people want to misuse the prophetic gift, and they end up uh, making what I would call modern prophecy equivalent to biblical prophecy, and they're not. The things that are in the pages of Scripture are unique, so we'll call them Big P Prophecy, as opposed to modern prophecy, which is little p prophecy. And the things that are in the pages of Scripture, we have, of course, the four major prophets, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And Jeremiah also wrote the Book of Lamentations, so there's actually five books for four authors. And then uh, we have the 12 minor prophets that uh, run Hosea through Malachi. And, you know, in addition to those, we could have, we could include what I would term prophetic history, meaning history written with a prophetic spin or a prophetic perspective on it right. by prophets. Um, and so first and second Samuel absolutely qualify. Um, arguably Joshua and judges and Ruth do as well. Yeah. I think uh, without much doubt, first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles could be included in that also, although some might get a little more uh, they might move it off of prophetic history just to purely history. But I, again, we see at various places the uh, the mind of the Lord coming through the hand of you know whoever compiled these books in, in the final version as they were incorporated into the canon. Right. And they oftentimes there are insights that are that are demonstrably prophetic in even the books of the Kings and Chronicles. So there's a lot of prophetic books in the Bible, and of course, let's not forget. Um, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, all of them, the books of Moses, who was, you know, numbered as the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament. So there's just a lot of it there. And, you know, one of the things we see repeatedly in Scripture is that when the Spirit of God comes on people, they commonly do prophesy. And so, for example, with Moses and the um, 70 elders, or some say 72, In Numbers chapter 11, uh, Moses brings them out to the tent at the instruction of the Lord that they would assist him in leading and um, guiding and governing Israel because Moses has too much work. And it says when the Spirit of God came on them, they prophesied, although they, in that case they didn't continue doing so. Um, And obviously when the prophets of the Old Testament, when they were 
uh, visited by the Lord when, as they say, the word of the Lord came to them, they begin prophesying. So we see this pattern, which, by the way, is picked up right again in the New Testament era. Yeah. A lot is often made of the gift of languages or tongues, as we more commonly call it. I, on that point, I just want to make one simple uh, comment. I don't myself generally like to use the word tongues, even though it's in common use. Yeah. The reason I don't like to use it is I think it's confusing. Yeah. Um, when the King James Bible was translated in 1611, the right way to say languages was tongue. So I speak the English tongue. In Germany, right. they speak the German tongue. But nobody really speaks that way anymore, except if they're either, I don't know, doing a Shakespearean play, or maybe they're trying to be deliberately formal. Otherwise, we say languages. And so I really think a better way to articulate that is the gift of languages. Yeah. Um, so a lot has been made of the gift of languages being the sign of the coming of the Spirit. But, you know, over and over again in the New Testament, we see they spoke in languages and they prophesied. They spoke in languages and they prophesied. Yeah. So part yeah. of the coming of the Spirit is the release of this modern gift of prophecy, which is, you know, it's, I would say, supplemental to uh, that which is in the Old Testament canon. But it is not, uh, it's not the same uh, quality of prophecy that we see released in the church, with a few exceptions. And those few exceptions are themselves already inscripturated because we find them captured by the writers of the New Testament, and they become incorporated into the corpus of the New Testament. So now those, those words, those specific prophetic words, are themselves canonical. So yeah. an example of this uh. is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul, speaking under inspiration, he knows he's prophesying. He says, now the Spirit, and he means the Holy Spirit, expressly states, so he's saying, you know, I'm speaking under plenary verbal inspiration when I say this. Um, the, the Holy Spirit expressly states that in latter times, some will give heed to seducing spirits and things taught by demons. Well, that almost becomes a springboard to the wider teaching of Paul on the weighing and testing and judging of prophetic utterance, because in his letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, yeah. Uh, chapter 5, verse 19, he says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterance or prophecies. It depends on which translation you're reading. Yeah. But test everything and hold yeah. fast to what is good. These are all one linked concept. There are three verses in our English Bible, but when Paul was writing this, there were no verse delimiters. It was just one continuous flow. And we might almost render this as do not quench the Spirit by despising prophetic utterance. Yeah but rather test everything so you'll know what's worthwhile. And having discerned that, hang on to the part that's good and obviously set aside that which isn't so good or isn't, isn't of any value. Mm. And with that, you'll get benefit from the prophetic ministry that's being ministered among you there in Thessalonica. Yeah. Well, Thessalonica was a, was a powerful church. It was the second largest outpouring Paul had. The greatest one of all was in uh, Ephesus which occurred after Thessalonica, late in his life. Um, but, but, you know, after Paul left Thessalonica, he makes his way south down the Greek peninsula, and he ultimately comes to Corinth. He has some stops along the way, but he ultimately gets to Corinth. And, you know, he's going to give the Corinthians essentially the same kind of guidance. He says, first of all, all of you can prophesy. He says this in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. And he says, not only can you all prophesy— but you should all burn with zeal to prophesy. So this should be something you highly aspire to and want. Wow. And that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. But then he goes on and he says, you know, if, if any of you is prophesying, let two or three who are known as prophets, who are known to have a you know, valid gift to prophesy with validity and benefit uh, because they have a track record, because they're, they're proven worthy people, let them – sit by and judge. Let them test and weigh these things, which is pretty much the same guidance he gave to the Thessalonians, except now he's being a little more specific about how to do it. Yeah. And he says, uh, with that, you know, what is of value will we'll retain, and what is of not value, well, then that we won't retain. 
And, you know, all of this is coming in the context of of the fact that there was widespread prophetic utterance in the ancient church, in the apostolic period. And in fact, going back to the church in Thessalonica, they were very confused by some of the things that were happening yeah. in the realm of prophecy, because in Second Thessalonians, Paul writes this, chapter 2, verse 1, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and of our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. In other words, don't be upset, don't be rattled, don't be knocked off balance. Mm. And then he says this very interesting language. It doesn't even fit our modern paradigm, but he says, by a spirit. And he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Right. He's talking about a yeah. spirit, meaning the demonic spirits, the spirits of other religions. And you know, one of the things that I think is really grossly undertaught in our modern churches is the clear articulation that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 10 of the fact that all the gods of the nation are actually demons. And so he's saying people may be prophesying by some other spirit, and it's probably in the name of some other god. Yeah. And Paul has to address this same issue again in Corinth. So we're kind of bouncing back and forth between Thessalonica and Corinth. They're both on the Greek peninsula, although Thessalonica is far enough north it's really it's in the you know kind of on the edge of what we today call the Balkans or the Macedonian region, mm -hmm. um, whereas Corinth is demonstrably far south. They're hundreds of miles apart, but same issues are going on in both contexts. Uh, they're speaking Greek. Uh, they're you know they're in the general part of the world, yeah. and so Paul has said to the Corinthians, if anyone says Jesus is cursed, they're not prophesying by the Holy Spirit. Mm. He says that in 1 Corinthians. Well, when he's talking to the Thessalonians, he's saying if someone speaks by a spirit, and again, it's a spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit, yeah. uh, or some other spoken word, whatever that is, maybe they made it up or somebody just is, yeah. you know, reading a poem or whatever, or even a letter that, that purports to come from us, meaning me, Timothy, and Silas, that essentially to the effect that the day of the Lord has come, don't be alarmed, don't be shaken, don't be knocked off balance. Um, because you could be, and it might actually seem credible, but it's not credible. This is part of why he previously had told the Thessalonians, you guys need to be a little more discerning. You need to weigh and assess these things, and some prophecy or what seems to be prophecy is actually not valid words from God. And, and so this is a discipline that in at least the congregation in Thessalonica as well as the one in Corinth, Paul enjoins upon them that they should be testing and weighing words, and there will be times they set them aside. And, you know, in our last broadcast, I made the argument that, you know, a lot of these words that were coming forth ahead of the election, they should have been weighed and tested, and they weren't. So that was a, that was a mistake. Yeah. Um, some might even, might even go so far as to say a sin, but I would just say, you know, we missed the scriptural guidance. And in that, uh, many people were led astray, which is the very thing Paul is concerned about in Thessalonica. So we're, we have a – it's not an identical situation because the issue wasn't the same. They were worrying about the return of Jesus and that they'd missed the rapture, Right. and we were worrying about an election. But it's the same idea. You know, you guys, you, you need to have a little bit of discernment here, and you need to, you need to use you know, the tools of – weighing and assessing prophecy. And I'll just say this, and then I'll shut up so you can respond. Um, you, you know, we could do a whole podcast on how to weigh and assess and test prophecy. Right. Um, I've done a lot of teaching on this in the past. If we do it today, it'll really take us far beyond where we, where we want to be, I think, and it'll get to be too long of a show. But, but the yeah. point is, there are, I think, clear uh, principles and guidelines in Scripture uh -huh. that need to be more widely taught. And that's part of the prophetic reformation that we, we need to have. Yeah. So I guess, would, would it be fair to say that <clears throat> those who would identify as cessationists, maybe um, some of them are, are being coming from a place that they have a high view of scripture, uh, but other, yep. other, other, there may be the temptation that they've fallen into where they say, we really don't want the hard work that it's going to take to be able to let the prophetic be released in our church and us have to do this, 
this very taxing exercise of letting the spirit move and trying to discern what's him and what's not him. I think it's, it's almost like, Hey, instead of having to go through all that, why don't we just have one guy up on stage preaching and let's just leave it at that. You know, do you think that that's part of the issue there is that to be able to let the prophetic be released in a church, it's going to require spiritual maturity. It's going to require spiritual unity. There's just some things that are, a lot that require a lot of energy to put in place in order to let the prophetic flow as a main feature of a church. Well, it does take some work. And as, uh, as the scripture itself says in the book of Proverbs, where you have the strength of the ox, the stall will not be clean. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, which, you know, obviously is, is literally true, but I think by extension, what it's really implying is that, if you're going to have benefit from something, sometimes it's a little bit more work. It's a little bit more messy. Yeah. You know, having the prophetic in the church, I don't know. If, I, I mean, there is some work involved. I don't want to make it sound like it's this arduous labor, but right. it, it requires it requires being uh, fluent enough in the guidelines and disciplines that are laid out in Scripture and then applying them diligently yeah. so that you know, we actually reap the benefit of prophetic ministry. Yeah. And for a lot of people, they may have never, they may have never been in a context where prophetic ministry was really practiced in this way, or for that matter, more importantly, maybe judged and weighed in this way. And so the idea of weighing a prophetic word or of trying to evaluate, Hey, is this one legit? Yeah. For a lot of people, that's going to be a new experience. And so there'll be a little bit of a learning curve, but you know, there are, there are churches who use prophetic ministry and have used prophetic ministry with great effect. Yeah. But again, we want to, we, I want to say it for the record again, we're not talking about creating new scripture here. Never, ever would we do that. Right. The scripture is, is sacrosanct. Um, it is, the canon is closed. And yeah. there have been some who have mistakenly said, well, you know, any prophetic word that comes is automatically right, and, and you know, you just need to believe it and stand on it. No, yeah, we silly. weigh and test it because the Bible itself tells us to do that. Yeah, I've often used the, the – in, on the issue of just the continuationism as a, as a theological perspective, I've often used the line of reasoning that says – I am a continuationist because I am sola scriptura. I, I, I am that because the Bible teaches that, not the other way around. I have no agenda to be able to leverage spiritual gifts, the gift of prophecy, any revelatory gift, to be able to displace Scripture, but rather to walk within the guidelines of it. So do you think that cessationism is an overreaction to the fear that somehow canon is going to be challenged? And is that a real fear? Uh, you know, are they being misled there? Are they allowing, you know, their emotional, which a high view of scripture, there's an emotional element to it and we should have a high view of scripture, but is that kind of perspective being almost so emphasized that it's like, Hey, let's even take, measures that would actually violate scripture in order to maintain our high view of it. You know, it seems kind of dangerous and that whole grieve the spirit concept. I know that the Lord is moving in churches that are not continuationist because I, I just, he, he moves wherever the name of Jesus is proclaimed. But I think we could make a strong case that the Holy spirit is being limited in those congregations. And that does grieve God's heart. So how would you uh, weigh in on that? Well, you know, it's a, it's a big, big conversation. Yeah. But uh, for those who want to dive more deeply than the answer I'm about to give, I'll just say up front, you might want to get a hold of a book by John Ruthven, R-U-T-H-V-E-N, John Ruthven. Um, he used to be a professor of systematic theology at Regent University. And uh, he has a couple of books out. One is called What's Wrong with Protestant Theology. And uh, the other one is called On the Cessation of the Charismata. Mm. And for those who are really into this 
from a theological standpoint and who are familiar with the theological arguments of people like Hodge and Warfield and John Calvin, people like that, um, he takes all of these on and really goes through it in great detail. These books are not going to be something you read in an evening, but right. but they will really comprehensively address the question you're raising. But let's move it off of the academic level and move it back to the um, you know the level of just the typical listener. Um, I think some people are cessationists because they are trying to protect scripture, and I can <clears throat> certainly appreciate that because I want to do that too. I think some people are cessationists because they've never seen or heard prophecy in action at all, and others have never seen it in action that they deem to be beneficial. In other words, they've watched people try to do it, maybe maybe like our last election here. Yeah. And uh and so as a result they've you know they backed away from it and said, well, you know, that was all ridiculous, so forget it. So there's there's gradations of where we find people and why they are where they are. But I, I think the I think the broader context we need to set is that in the Bible, whenever the Spirit of God sh- comes on people, it seems that prophecy uh, comes forth. And I would say that, you know, in the last roughly 110 years or so, uh, maybe 115, since since the Azusa Street Revival, which broke out in Los Angeles in 1906, uh, there's been a, a very strong emphasis on what is typically known as the gift of tongues. Yeah. I prefer the term gift of languages. And the reason is tongues is an out of date term. I mean, we all have a tongue, but we don't use it that way. We we refer to the tongue as a you know a part of the body, right. but um, but in the Bible when we talk about the gift of tongues, that's a term from the King James Bible that's been carried over into some of our modern translations. And when we talk about tongues, we really mean languages. And so um, you know when this this is an Elizabethan English term, and so I'm currently speaking the English tongue. Right. Or someone from Germany speaks in the German tongue, or someone in Mexico maybe speaks the Spanish tongue. Well, unless we're trying to be very formal, or maybe we're, you know, doing a Shakespeare play or something like that, we generally don't use the word tongue in that way. So I believe it's actually confusing to modern listeners of the term. But so when we say the gift of tongues, What we really mean is the gift of languages. These are diverse languages that have not been learned through the normal means of learning a language. And in addition to the gift of tongues, we see in the New Testament, as well as the Old, the gift of prophecy. And so the very first place we really see this uh, demonstrated is in Numbers 11, where Moses brings these elders of Israel out to the tent of meeting, to the tabernacle, and... God says, I'm going to put my spirit on them and they're going to help you judge Israel because Moses, you have too much work to do and you know, you need to spread it around and they're going to need the wisdom that the spirit of God gives them in order to pull this off because you lead by the spirit and they're going to need to do the same. And so it says when the spirit of God came down upon them, they prophesied, but they didn't do so again. So the important delimiter here is when they received the spirit, they prophesied. Now, someone's going to say, well, why didn't they speak in languages? Because they did it in the New Testament. It's a really important question, super important and often overlooked. In the Old Testament, essentially what we see is the gift of prophecy being poured out on Jews, generally Jewish prophets, right? Yeah. But sometimes the kings. Um, but OK, and we see an anointing coming on priests as well. Yeah. So, but they're all speaking Hebrew. They don't need to speak in other languages because everybody is speaking Hebrew. That's just the way it rolls. Yeah. So we don't need the gift of languages. Whereas in the New Testament, coming in Acts 2 and beyond, what happens is now all nations are being invited in. Yes. And in fact, we see uh, this in Acts 2 that, you know, we see people from uh, Ty, um, you know, Cyprus and uh, Cyrene and, you know, all these all other places, areas. Yeah that are hearing the word of God in their own languages, because now, as was always promised, by the way, from Isaiah 59 and through Jeremiah, the idea of pouring out the Spirit on all flesh, Joel talks about this in Joel 2, there was, that promise is being fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is being distributed upon anybody who will believe in Jesus 
you know, be baptized, confess his name, all of that. Yeah. And so with it, we need the gift of languages as a proof, as a sign that all peoples are now invited. And it doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter what color their skin is. It doesn't matter whether they're male or female. It doesn't matter whether they're young or old. This is now open to everybody. And this is the significance of not only Acts 2, but as we go to Acts 8 and we see the evangelization of the Samaritans, they speak in languages. And then we go to Acts 10 with Cornelius and the Romans, and they speak in languages. And then when Paul gets to Ephesus in Acts 19, they speak in languages when he puts his hands upon them. So, so they the were idea of prophesying. speaking in languages, oh yeah, they were prophesying and speaking in languages. And this is why the two gifts are, they occur side by side. They're not the same gift, but they occur side by side. So yeah. now I want to go back to prophecy, which is what we really were talking about. In every one of those instances, in every one of them, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, every mm. single case, it says they spoke in languages and they prophesied. It does, yeah. And so prophecy is a durable gift that Paul actually encourages the Corinthians. All of you can do it, and all of you should desire to do it. Yes. And as you do it, weigh it to make sure it has value and benefit which is, again, the same instruction that he'd given the Thessalonians. And so with this, I would argue that prophecy is a very important gift, and if we don't do it, we actually are the poorer for it, and our witness is, is weakened. In fact, Paul says that if an unbeliever or somebody who's among the untaught walks in and you're all speaking prophecies, specifically prophecies, not even languages, prophecies, he says, that one will fall on his face among you and say, God is truly among you people. I want to be, I want to be part of this. Yes. So there's a, there's a right. credibility factor. There's an evangelistic angle. I mean, all of this is wrapped up in good quality prophecy, but we have to keep it in bounds, which is why we weigh and test it. Yeah. And, and you know, last night we were having our Wednesday night. We have what's called Wednesday night fire here at the church. And we just kind of worship. We pray. We let prophecy happen. We let people share words and and uh, and last night we had someone in here who was in need of a miracle, and the Holy Spirit began to speak and began to lay that on our hearts. Someone in here needs a miracle, and someone in the in back of the back left corner of the room raised their hand, and all of a sudden they're just the Holy Spirit just began to minister to this lady. People were able to go over to her and share a word from the Lord, and she just began to melt. And that's that's where I see what you're saying. It's the continuation of Pentecost in the churches where the spirit is, is moving and he's giving Rhema words that are relevant to those who are present, which might prick their hearts and cause them to know Jesus in a tangible way. And so, you know, I, I think it's relevant what you're talking about with Thess Thessalonica and, uh, and with, uh, Cor Corinth, uh, Corinth, um, they were the spirit had invaded these communities in the same way that they had been, it had been poured out in Jerusalem i think is what you're saying and so prophecy was happening but you also had people coming in under a wrong spirit or from their flesh kind of disrupting the prophetic ministry of the spirit and so we have the apostle paul now saying all right here's some basic guidelines that can work against this disruption of the spirit and the glorification of Jesus. Is that kind of where you're seeing all the dots yep. connected? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, by the way, since we're, since we're here, we might as well also mention that um, John in his first letter, not his gospel, but his first letter, he even says that we should test the spirits because not every spirit is from God. Yeah. Again, they have a very different worldview from what we have in modern America. They yeah. understand that there are many spirits in the world that are demonic, that bring false prophecy. That, you know, prophecy was, I would say, rife in the ancient world. The Greeks uh, were, were quite into it, the Oracle of Delphi being the most famous of them all, and none other than Artaxerxes and Alexander the Great consulted the Oracle of Delphi for prophetic words before going out to war. And of course, we have the, the legacy from the scripture uh, that attests to 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar having his wise men and enchanters, who, among other things, would have been deemed to be prophets. And, and my favorite and we one see is the, the same chickens. Thing with the Egyptians. I like the I'm chickens. Sorry? I like the chickens of the Romans. Don't you like the sacred chickens? <laughs> you know, yeah. they had the sacred yeah. sacred chickens that would tell them whether or not they, that they were going to win the battle. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Uh, that's one of the best ones in pagan culture, in my opinion. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Yep, that's right. So, I mean, this kind of thing was was well known in the ancient world. We don't really do this in modern America, nor, by the way, was it done very much. Maybe here and there, kind of in out of the way places, but not in the center of society from roughly the time of the Reformation forward, maybe somewhat in the Middle Ages, but even not so much then. I mean, to really find a, a proliferation of this in European society and, you know, a lot of our intellectual tradition, et cetera, especially theologically, it comes out of Europe. And so, you know, by the time Calvin, by the time Luther, by the time Zwingli, you know, these kinds of people, Melanchthon, by the time they are writing their theologies, they're moving in a much more rationalistic way. They, they aren't really even attuned to these things. But here's the context, not just of the ancient world that I've already you know, outlined. I obviously could go deeper, but we're on a podcast. We can't say everything, so yeah. we'll just leave it there. But Paul the Apostle has a point of view that's rooted in Scripture. Um, he says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 that that anybody who sacrifices to an idol is actually sacrificing to demons. He, he literally says that, and wow. I think that's often overlooked. And he says, by the way, if you do this as a Christian, you might well end up under the influence of demons. Ah. So this is all found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 22. Mm. Where did Paul get that idea? Well, he got it from Psalm 106. And in verses 35 through 37, it says, literally, all of the gods of the nations are demons. Uh, This is totally out of step with our modern world. We've been taught to be pluralistic, and if people are religious, it's all good. And who are you to be so condemning and so forth? But, But actually, from a Jewish Christian standpoint, we believe that there's only one true God. I mean, there are many masquerading gods. Right. Demons love to arrogate worship to themselves in any way they can, and so... They may give themselves names like let's let's talk about ancient Corinth names like Artemis, Artemis or, yeah. or Pluto or Poseidon, yeah. and so the people were worshiping these ancient gods, but they were worshiping demons. Yeah. And Paul is saying all the gods of the nations are demons. He's coming out of a very strong Jewish background with a good rabbinic tradition, and he's relying on the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures, in this case Psalm 106, yeah. to understand that. These other gods are, in fact, demonic spirits. Well, John has that same perspective, and that's why he says, test all the spirits, because there are many false prophecy spirits that have gone out into the world, and they will lead you astray. So again, we're back to the idea that not every prophetic word should be taken at face value. We really need to be on our toes. And there are stories in the Bible that actually buttress the very thing I just said. Yeah. In my First uh, Kings 22, we have the story of the prophet Micaiah, who says all of the prophets that are before Ahab and Jehoshaphat have a spirit of false prophecy. He specifically uses the term lying spirit, yeah, but lying it's a spirit, spirit of false prophecy, right? So he's he's talking about this, and we see some other places in Scripture where this same dynamic is going on. But see, again, in our world, because we don't really understand that. Prophecy comes under the inspiration of something. It might be our own flesh, it might be a demonic spirit, or yeah. it might be the Holy Spirit. We we tend to say, well, no, 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 that, 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 no, no, that's not the way it really works. Well, that is actually the biblical witness, and so we need to conform our thinking to the biblical witness. And with that, we can see exactly why Paul is saying, you got to test this stuff and be sure it's really legitimately from the Holy Spirit and not from one of these other sources. That's right. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to get your 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 feedback. Obviously, there is the 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 way of testing prophecy that is that is primarily um, reliant upon the Holy Spirit in us. The example of Paul and the the fortune teller girl in Acts, where he spiritually discerns 
that she is speaking by a demon, a spirit of divination, and, and he, he says he cast the spirit of divination out of her. So that's obviously the gift of distinguishing spirits there. But then, you know, in addition to that, what I typically encourage people, the three basic tests of pre uh, testing prophecy is, you know, does it contradict Scripture? Does it glorify right. Jesus? And does it edify, yep. exhort, and comfort? So how would you kind of, I know we don't have a lot of, of time to really get into the nuances of it, but if we were to give someone just a crash course, hey, here's how you can begin the process of testing prophecy. Obviously, lean on the Holy Spirit in you, ask if it contradicts Scripture, see if it glorifies Jesus, and does it edify, exhort, and comfort? What would you say to that? Well, I agree with all of those, and I think there are some other tests as well. One is to test the prophet himself or herself. Yeah. Um, for example, we see, well, most people say Balaam yeah. uh, in the book of Numbers. And I say it that way because that's not actually how you say it in Hebrew, but in, yeah. in American English, we would say Balaam. So Balaam is deemed to be a false prophet, even though it's abundantly clear from the book of Numbers, that he actually has a valid prophetic gift. Ah. And this is exactly why Balak, the king, wants to hire him to put a curse on the people of Israel. Yeah. He believes, he knows that the, Balaam, the Balaam has this, this power, and he's willing to pay good money for it because he's frightened of the Jews. Yeah. And so, you know, in the end, Balaam goes along with him, even though the Lord has told him, don't do it. And he's, he's given a very severe treatment in the pages of the New Testament. And they say, you know, it was his greed that led him astray. So here's a prophet who has a gift, but he's greedy. And ah. because he's greedy, he's deemed a false prophet. Wow. Well, wow. that's a character issue, isn't it? Yeah. And then we see. Fruits. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then we see um, in the book of Jude, it talks about those who are false prophets who come to the love feasts, which are, you know, I guess the modern equivalent would be some kind of a church potluck, but I think it was a more yeah. spiritual event than a typical potluck. Yeah. But anyway, they come to the love feast, and they're called clouds without rain, and they are deemed to be false prophets. Why? Well, because they're immoral. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Now, I'm not saying everybody who's been out you know, prophesying ahead of this election is, uh, is you know, greedy or immoral, but I'm just saying these are the kinds of issues we need to look at when we weigh and assess someone's life. And if we see that someone, for example, is divisive, yeah. what does Paul say? I have nothing to do with a divisive man. Mm. And so there's actually quite a bit in Scripture that encourages us to weigh the prophet, yeah. not just the prophecy. Uh -huh. And then we have the all-important test of, did it come to pass? Yeah. Now, of course, you won't know if it's really coming to pass until the event spoken of either does or doesn't happen. Yeah. But by definition, if it failed to come to pass, then it wasn't from the Lord. So, you know, yeah. all these words about Trump's going to win, Trump's going to win, they were all wrong. And, and I can be very matter of fact about it yeah. without being condemning, because again, I'm just weighing and testing words and I'm saying, all right, we just take all these and set them to the side. They were all wrong. Now, is and, it possible? You know, I, I think, it, go ahead. Is it possible that through the power and insight of the Holy Spirit, that you might be able to discern uh, even prior to it coming to pass. Like, for example, what if the Holy Spirit shows you that they're operating in the flesh? You know what I'm saying? Like, so is there an Absolutely. element to, because I was thinking about that strict guideline of the Old Testament that says, wait and see if it comes to pass, but the New Testament dynamic <clears throat> has the added benefit of the Holy Spirit in us. So, Yes, obviously there are certain things where you just have to wait on it, but there there have been times where someone prophesied a predictive prophecy that I just it didn't resonate with my spirit. So, you know, have you experienced that in your life as well? Yes, um, <sighs> there are there, when when true and valid prophecy comes forth, and again, you'd have to be around it to have this experience. Otherwise, it's it's very theoretical. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like saying, let me tell you about skydiving. Well, if you've never jumped out of an airplane, you don't actually know yeah. what that's all about. Yeah. Um, but when you're around true and valid prophecy, when it's a legitimate word, it's almost like when somebody, you know, rings a bell, there's kind of a resonance to it that in, it, it's not so much audible in the physical sense, but in the spirits of the people who are there, you'll, you'll often hear the whole room go, 
Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> praise God. Oh yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Because th their spirits are resonating and yeah. they know, wow, that's the word of the Lord. And similarly, um, if you have a cracked bell, it won't go, bang, it'll go clunk. And sometimes people give these words and it just sort of lands like, as they say, it goes over like a lead balloon. <laughs> and <laughs> you know. go, oh, that was not the word of the Lord. And sometimes people are almost so embarrassed, they don't want to further embarrass the person who prophesied. So they'll just sort of let it go by. Yeah. But but I can remember when John Wimber was alive, there would be times that these words would come out. And John would say, everyone disregard that word that is not a valid word from the Lord. Well, <laughs> think about the poor person who gave that word. <laughs> but, but, but John was actually, you know, after the integrity of the word of God, both written and spoken. Yeah. And so while he wasn't trying to beat up the prophets, so to speak, he was actually trying to say um, there is a place where, that, where we really need to be testing this. Yeah. Mm. And then another thing that's important is very often with uh, prophetic words, they aren't just foretelling the future, although they can do that. Yeah. Very often they have other pieces of information in them, embedded in them. Uh, we see this, for example, in Samuel's prophecy that he gives to Saul as he anoints him and says, you know, you're going to be the king. And then he gives him this word about how he's going to meet a group of prophets when he gets near Rachel's tomb in the territory of Zelza. And, uh, you know, he'll be near the great well of Seku, and they'll be carrying goats and skins of wine, and they'll be prophesying. And these are the exact instruments they'll be playing. And as it turns out, every single piece of that information that Samuel gives him as credibility markers is what we would call them today. Yeah. Uh, every single piece of that comes to pass. Why? Well, because Samuel's a valid prophet of the Lord. And as the scripture says, none of his words fell to the ground. Yeah. So when we see true prophecy to the extent that it includes those credibility markers, and they don't all include them, but, but often they do yeah. to the extent those credibility markers are there, we ought to be able to verify essentially in real time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly why Paul says to the Corinthians, if someone gets up and starts to prophesy and says, you know, in the name of the whatever, in the name of Zeus, you know, Jesus <laughs> is cursed. Paul says, you can just throw that one out right away because the, the whole thing is wrong. The entire premise is wrong. That's right. Even though these people are Christian believers in the Christian church that I planted. Right. Mm, that's interesting. Well, I, I, I'm thinking about we we we've we've done a little bit of a crash course on okay the recipients of the prophetic word, but you know we also talked for a moment about how the Bible gives this this kind of idea or at least this picture, especially drawing out of Joel chapter two, your sons and daughters shall prophesy that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit enables individual to prophesy, obviously in accordance with the measure of faith that they would get been given. So everybody prophesies from a different place. But what would you say, like, in Scripture, it says that the sons of Issachar knew the, uh, the times and seasons they were in and what Israel should do. And, like, how, do, how would you encourage somebody who's trying to mature in prophecy, how they can speak from that place of spiritual discernment rather than from their emotions or maybe their internal biases? Like, what do you, if you have a, an unction from the Lord, how do you kind of learn to grow into a place where you don't filter yourself into it? Well, again, that's its own whole podcast. lesson and I podcast. Know. We're doing the crash course version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so the, the key concept is spiritual neutrality, which means that we have to come to the place where we are neutral with respect to our own desires and wants with, with regard to whatever the subject matter is. Yeah. Now, it's a really important and highly nuanced uh, position because in general we all have opinions about things those yeah. generally are in the realm of the mind yeah and sometimes we have sentiments or emotions we we may love something or hate something and and you know often we think of people prophesying in this because they you know they they say bad words they they're angry at somebody and so they want to prophesy them to death but i've seen as many words arise from uh, I would say good hearted emotion, which is nevertheless misplaced. For example, here's Mary and Ben and they want to have a baby and they haven't been able to have a baby. 
And so someone walks up and says, well, the Lord showed me you're going to get pregnant. And about this time next year, you'll have a child. And you know, obviously that prophet is trying to mimic the language of scripture. Well, a year comes and goes and 15 months come and go and 18 months. And now it's two years. And Mary and Ben still don't have their child. Well, probably what happened there is that prophet that gave them that word loves Mary and Ben and wants to see them happy and wants them to have a baby. Yeah. And so they were prophesying out of their love for Mary and Ben. But in this case, that love wasn't divine love. It wasn't it wasn't. The, I mean, I don't un, don't don't mistake what I'm saying. They, they probably have a yeah. genuine measure of agape. Yeah. But their emotion of affection for yeah. Mary and Ben has tangled up the words such that they've prophesied amiss. And we yeah. see this all the time, right? So-and-so won't die, or uh-huh. you know, this, this, this situation is going to resolve, and it doesn't. Yeah. So we actually have to get to the place where, and it requires a measure of maturity where we can say, okay, I know what I want. I want Mary and Ben to have a baby. But we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, what do you have to say about this? And in that, we wait until the word of the Lord comes. Yeah. Mm. And that's a really important concept. We see it over and over with David. It says he inquired of the Lord, he inquired of the Lord, he inquired of the Lord. But we also see in Jeremiah 42, verse 7, an account where the elders of Israel come to Jeremiah and they want to ask a question, you know, is the city, do you have a word for, do you have a word for us? Because we're in really bad shape here. The Babylonians are surrounding us and What's going to happen? Yeah. And Jeremiah, who, by the way, he's a legit prophet, isn't he? He's Jeremiah. And, you know, he's he actually writes the second longest prophetic book in the Bible. So he's got a lot to say. Yeah. And Jeremiah says, I don't know. Let me go ask the Lord. He doesn't just fire off a word. Oh, yeah, the Lord says not all prophets walk around with a prophetic word in their pocket all. Yeah, that's good. And so it says in Jeremiah 42, 7, 10 days later, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Uh, Now, I think there's an amazing learning in that and an incredible discipline for all of us who want to prophesy to take on ourselves. If Jeremiah the prophet needed to wait 10 days to get a word from God, then there will be times when we will have to wait to hear from God and we dare not just spout off because of either our own sentiments in our mind or our own emotions in our heart. The mind and the emotions are two, are two of the three predominant aspects of the human soul. Yeah. And so with that, I call that kind of prophecy soulish prophecy because it's originating out of these dimensions of the soul. Yeah. True prophetic utterance emerges, as it says, as the spirit gives utterance. So we get the word of the Lord born by the Holy Spirit, and we release the word of the Lord that God gives us. And if we're doing it correctly, where we're under that discipline, we will prophesy only what the Lord gives us to speak. Yeah. And part of how we do that is we are in prophetic community where other prophets can weigh and test our words. So maybe we get the word of the Lord and we say, hey, you know, uh, next week when I go to go to Pastor Kyle's service i want to release this word well let's submit this to the prophets ahead of time that are in our company here that know pastor kyle that know the church that are you know that are part of this community let's just weigh and test this collectively as the body of christ yeah and that idea is again foreign to most of us because america is so highly individualistic yeah that much of the time we 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 almost balk and flinch at the idea of that kind of submission of words that we think we have from God to the wider prophetic community. Yeah. So I guess one thing that a lot of pastors like myself on that point that you were just making, especially coming out of an Azusa street revival movement, our, the, the charismatic movement came out of a spontaneous, well, it wasn't spontaneous obviously because there was a lot of fasting and prayer with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Seymour, William Seymour and his, his companions that, that kind of was, was there, but w- with the nature and the kind of the, <clears throat> the culture of Azusa street, uh, birthing the Pentecostal modern Pentecostal movement, that culture had a lot of spontaneity to it. 
Uh, and there was a lot of really interesting moves of the spirit, a lot of really powerful prophecy coming forward in these meetings. And, and that has uh, in some way characterized the, the culture of the charismatic church. And so how do you find that balance? Because to me, some Sundays it's like, or Wednesday nights, it's like, Hey, let's let God move. And we're probably going to get six or seven people give an accurate prophecy. And I'm okay. If one doesn't like, um, yeah. uh, whereas if I throttled it down too much, I might end up prohibiting those seven good prophecies that would have been given in my attempt to block out that one fleshly or soulish prophecy that you're talking about. So how have you seen that dynamic work in different ministries? And would you err more on the side of let's let the Holy Spirit move or let's throttle it back? You know, how do you find that balance? Yeah, I, I absolutely want to create space for the Spirit of God to speak prophetically. And I would add with that, by the way, in languages with interpretation of those languages. Yeah. And so I've, I've seen this over and over again. Um, I remember one meeting I did some years ago, <clears throat> maybe five or six years ago now. And I was, uh, I was in Western Australia, essentially in the area of Perth. Yeah. Uh, but not right in the center of Perth. And um, I, I was teaching on prophetic ministry to uh, a group of people, and we had about maybe four or 500 people in the meeting. And I said, I'd, I'd finished the teaching, and I said, now, we've taught on this. It's time for us to do this. And people kind of looked around nervously, and I said, I'm going to call down the Holy Spirit uh, which is my language for there's too many of you for me to go lay hands on all of you like Paul did or like <laughs> Peter did or whatever. And so we're just going to invoke the Holy Spirit on the room, and we're going to ask the Spirit of God to release uh, prophetic utterance. And so that began to happen. And yeah. not only did we get prophecy, we also had many languages given with interpretation of those languages. And I know somebody will probably be listening to this, so I'll answer the question that's in their head. Well, doesn't the scripture say only two or three can speak and let the others interpret? Yeah. Uh, uh. Yes, it does say that. But I think what Paul is doing there is not giving something that is uh, meant to be restrictive, but rather it's just a good guideline for how to run a general service. Because after all, we got kids in the nursery and we got to get those, those child care workers out at some point. And if everybody starts prophesying, because he's already said you all can. Uh, this service might go for five or six hours, and that that becomes in itself problematic. So, you know, let two or three prophesy, and that'll be enough for now. Um, we can always prophesy later. You know, the prophets are the, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, and maybe in a somewhat different context, like mine, which was more of a conference slash workshop setting, as opposed to a strict and proper church service. We might actually let many, many more words come forth. Yeah. And so with that, the Spirit of God began moving. And I want to say that the prophetic ministry flowed for, you know, it was like 45 minutes. Uh. And I don't know, we had a, well over 100 words and, and languages with interpretation of those languages that came forward. And the thing that was really amazing, and again, unless you've ever been around this and experienced it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have any framework for even understanding what I'm talking about. But there, it's like listening to a fugue. If you know what a fugue is, hmm. um, there's always a recurrent theme that comes back again and again and again. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm thinking right now, my, one of my favorite pieces of classical music is Bach's D minor fugue. And there, the, the, that, that recurrent theme is do, 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 over and over through the piece of music, that recurs. And it's, it comes back sometimes very much in the front. Sometimes it's a bit in the background. And there's another part of the music that's more in the fore. Yeah. But you hear that, that refrain again and again and again. And that's what happens in a prophetic meeting like this. Yeah. Whether it's a language that gets interpreted or whether it's a prophetic word, you hear that, that theme like a fugue rising and falling. And it, it, it's powerful um, it will it will cause some to you know fall out in the spirit as we say get slain in the spirit. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people will start having visions. Uh, angelic visitations are not rare. There's something that is released in that 
ferments of the true and valid gift of prophecy that you can't get it any other way. And I think we are the poorer for it in many of our church services because we don't have those opportunities. Now, yeah. again, that might not work so well on Sunday morning when we got to get the kids out and, you know, the service is 90 minutes, but when you're in a different format yeah. and you've got maybe a three or four hour thing where you're going to have teaching and ministry and all that, it works really great. And I'll tell you, when I've had these meetings like this, people are blown away. They walk out, they're like, I had no idea. Oh my gosh, what an unbelievable gift. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, that's that 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 takes my thoughts in all kinds of places. But I would say what I'm extracting from what we're talking about is like, you know, Paul was dealing with certain issues in certain churches, and we shouldn't make those things uh, into hard rules, but but principles and ideals that we we are guided by, and and understanding the the you know the the format that he was addressing there, but also understanding that there are other formats where there was a lot of liberty in the spirit. I mean, the day of Pentecost would be the most uh, obvious where the Holy Holy Spirit kind of just moved and you don't see any of the apostles standing up trying to guide the process. And so I think exactly. that to kind of limit the whole way that we let the prophetic work itself out in church to just a couple of chapters, chapters in the epistles without also observing the many events in the book of Acts, uh, it would be an imbalanced approach. And so I think that's really interesting. So any final thoughts as we close for this week? And who knows, we, you know, we'll, I'll talk with you uh, after the podcast about uh, unpacking some of these bigger themes here in the near future, uh, potentially. But uh, what would be your uh, final thoughts on, on some of the things we talked about today? Well, um, I'm writing my doctoral dissertation on the role of prophetic ministry in uh, catalyzing or triggering Wake, awakenings and revivals. And, you know, we're living in a time where everyone's been saying, you know, a great revival is coming. This has sort of been on the wind now for, uh, well, roughly since 1988 or nine is really when that word started to spring forth. So we're, you know, 32 or three years into this, I guess. And uh, people are like, well, when when's the revival going to come? And, you know, the thing that I I really long for is to see many, many people born again. I mean, I love the gifts of the spirit and I'm all about prophetic ministry, as you can tell, but, yeah. but I, I believe prophecy is, has a, has a specific purpose in the church. And one of them is to trigger and catalyze awakening because throughout the pages of the Bible, and I could demonstrate it throughout history and I'm you know, writing my dissertation to do exactly that. Um, throughout all of that, um, prophecy is usually right there alongside of great revivals and awakenings. An example of it, and I'll only give this one, is Josiah starts to reform Israel when he comes to power, and he's been at it for 12 years, kind of slogging away as the king. I mean, he, he does have a positional advantage, I guess, because he is the king. Yeah. But it says... And the Lord raised up Jeremiah the prophet to work alongside of him in the 13th year of the, of the reform. And so the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, and he becomes a, an associate of Josiah's in all of that reformist movement. And Josiah sets a number of things back in order. I mean, sadly, in the aftermath of Josiah's death, uh, Judah reverts to the uh, idolatrous ways that she had had ahead of Josiah that, that had actually come from his grandfather, Manasseh. But the point is here that prophecy was operating right alongside, and, and really good prophecy, it's Jeremiah, um, prophecy is operating right alongside of the, of the uh, revival that Josiah was leading that included, A, the rediscovery of the Bible and the reading of it publicly, B, the reinstitution of the Passover, which probably in our day would be a recovery of the message of the cross and the blood of Christ and, you know, the proper coming to the cross for atonement. I mean, these things were thematically going on in Josiah's revival and Jeremiah the prophet was right there. So we need prophecy as much for the awakening and salvation of America as anything. I want to see prophetic ministry be a, I don't know, a parlor trick or something that you know, we just use for fun and games in the church. There's actually yeah. a very strategic dimension to it. That's good. 
Absolutely. And I'm, I'm right there with you on that. And I, listen, I want to thank you again for joining us today. I think we covered uh, from more of an atmospheric level, a lot of different topics today that I hope got our, our viewers thinking about these issues because we will need to continue unpacking these things on the channel here in the near future. So thank you, Ken, for joining us. Thank you for tuning in today. If you have questions for us, send those over uh, in the comment section. I'll be taking a look at the comment section of this video for the next few days, trying to answer some of your questions. Uh, with that being said, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next week.